So I'd like to kick off Lightning Talks for today. We have had an amazing event. I'm so glad all of you could stay until the end. I think you're going to be rewarded for staying. We have some amazing Lightning Talks lined up for you. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I won't even give you a peek at them because I want you to feel the same excitement that I felt when I saw those names go down the form. Now, there have been some complaints from attendees about the quality of jokes during the sessions I moderate. <laughs> Jeremy is, has gladly offered to help. So in the downtime between talks, Jeremy will be providing a higher standard of jokes. I don't think he can do it, but we'll let him give a chance. Now, as you've seen, we've, we do things differently every PyData event. And we try to iterate and improve this event as much as possible. One thing that we've noticed is that it's difficult to get people to sign up for Lightning Talks. A lot of you are very busy, and you don't have time to put slides together. To solve this problem, we decided we'll make the slides for you, and you just have to come up and give the talk. <laughs> so for the first time ever, I want to invite somebody from the audience to give an impromptu lightning talk, having never seen the slides before. Do I have any volunteers? Any volunteers at all? OK, Brian Granger. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Brian, thank you for being such a sport. All you have to do, the slides are on my computer, just press page down. It should all be self-explanatory. Is this like one of those roasts? That, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> all right, let's go for it. I'll press click here, press page down. Any volunteers? Uh, any volunteers? Oh. Uh, I guess I volunteers. Uh, so these sl slides were prepared for me by NumFocus. Um, I, I think that's, I'm guessing that that's actually a lie <laughs> um, in the sense that they were probably prepared by James. We'll see. We'll see, okay. <laughs> maybe, he, maybe he had some help. Page down, please. Page down, okay. Uh, I have not seen these slides beforehand. <laughs> that is uh, quite true. Uh, don't worry, I'm a pro. <laughs> And actually, uh, there was a little bit of preparation that happened in advance. And, and James, I'm willing to give a talk that you've prepared if you're willing uh, to put on a, uh, an outfit that we've prepared. <laughs> and and, and we, we appreciate your high style New York uh, wardrobe, but, but we were starting to wonder if you're really a supporter of Pi Data. And so while I give the talk, you need to put on a Pi Data t shirt. I need someone to help me with my jacket. <laughs> Please. <laughs> okay. I'll put this on. All right. All right. Don't worry, I'm a pro. Uh, my name is, insert name here. <laughs> I'm a NumFocus board member. Uh, my name is Brian Granger. Uh, I am a NumFocus uh, board member, and I also uh, am one of the leaders of IPython and Jupyter and uh, I'm also involved in a number of the other projects in this uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, this wasn't actually spur of the moment. Uh, I was a plant. <laughs> it's called theatrics, people. Uh, but seriously, I haven't seen this PowerPoint before. Uh, am I allowed to say, I'm allowed to say things that are not on the slides, right? You're allowed to say things that are not on the slides. You can riff. Um, so uh, this is, this type of thing has been done at other Pi Datas, and uh, it, it, so there is some precedence for this. One thing I, I want to emphasize is that uh, a lot of the core members of the different projects, um, IPython and Matplotlib and NumPy and SciPy, uh, we have all known each other for a, uh, quite a long time, um, all the way back uh, to the early 2000s, uh, and some people here uh, even before uh, 2000. And one thing that I love about NumFocus and PyData is the, the family aspect of it. Uh, people here, uh, I have been uh, involved in their lives, and they've been involved in my lives uh, for a long time. And it's a great family. Um, but one important thing is that families do get to laugh together and occasionally laugh uh, at each other. Uh, these slides were going to be PowerPoint, but I'm incapable of giving a presentation outside 
uh, of the uh, Jupiter notebook, that is. <laughs> uh, not entirely true. <laughs> Very nice. I, I guess I should. <laughs> I guess I should just stay on script. <laughs> uh, let's move on. So, welcome to Pi Data. This is the twelfth Pi Data, and the twelfth uh, and Ford, uh, fourth Pi Data in New York City. <laughs> um, copy edit. Um, we're glad that you all could make it. Uh, I hope I just said y'all, uh, and, I, and I think I did. Uh, seriously, dude, follow the slides. Uh, we sold over 530 tickets to over 350 attendees. Uh, needless to say, it was a very profitable event. Uh, we ran 73 sessions with over 82 presenters. We added some new sessions to our lineup. Uh, first, poster sessions. Next, what's new in the various core open source uh, projects, discussion sessions, and birds of a feather sessions. We've already had amazing feedback from you and would love to get more. So I, I had a great time at Pi Data NYC this year. The talks were very engaging and the other attendees were amazing. First name, last name, uh, company, uh, and uh, first name, last name. I, I'm guessing that you're supposed to tweet this or, or something like that. Um, uh, please join me in a round of applause for all of our presenters. Here we go. Uh, this event would not have been possible without our sponsors. Uh, I'm assuming uh, it's going to go through. Yes. Uh, Continuum Analytics is the founding sponsor. Let's give them a hand. Dado, or Dado, is a diamond sponsor. Thank you for that. Uh, Bank of America is a host uh, here in, for the, the physical space and also platinum sponsor. And then other platinum sponsors are Microsoft, Treasure Data, and Two Sigma. Gold sponsor in MaxPoint. And silver sponsors of DE Shaw, Moat, Teza, and Edgestream. Uh, video, media, and community sponsors of Parsley, O'Reilly, sorry, my eyes are bad, uh, Python Weekly, Galvanize, ACM, iHeart New York. Uh, Pi Ladies, and uh, WI MLDS, which is Women in Machine Learning and Data Science, I think. Oh, let's give them a uh, please join me in another round of applause for our sponsors. We couldn't have done this without the folks at NumFocus. NumFocus is, insert patter here. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to say something about NumFocus. Um, so NumFocus is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, that was founded uh, to be uh, a, a support and, and to advocate for uh, open science, uh, open data science, and the software tools uh, that support uh, open science and data science, and then also uh, other aspects of that, including education, outreach, diversity, and the Pi Data conferences. Uh, all, many of the open source projects that you have heard about uh, during these three days are part of NumFocus. And what do I mean by that? Uh, NumFocus is the legal uh, and fiscal umbrella for these open source projects. So from a legal perspective, IPython and Jupyter are part of NumFocus. From a legal perspective, uh, a lot of the other projects, uh, Pandas, I, let's, well, I don't want to press page down, it might be dangerous, it might be something else. Um, but please visit the NumFocus site 
uh, many of the projects here are, are part of or, or about to become part of NumFocus. Um, I am currently one of the board members uh, of NumFocus. Um, and I'm trying to think, are there other NumFocus board members here in the room? Okay, Travis, uh, who's one of the founding board members, uh, is going to give a lightning talk. Um, one thing that's, that's really important is that uh, while open software is free uh, to the users of the, of the software, uh, it is definitely not free to develop. Uh, and uh, many of us work uh, full time or with a lot of our time or with a lot of our spare time uh, on these projects. And uh, it's really important uh, to support the different projects. Uh, we are very fortunate with IPython and Jupyter right now to have very generous uh, funding, a, a large new grant uh, from the Sloan, Moore, and Helmsley Foundations. A lot of the other open source projects that are a part of NumFocus uh, do not have funding. Um, and that funding, the lack of funding, has a direct impact on their ability to deliver features to you and to fix bugs. And so if you want uh, to make a difference in the open source projects, obviously you're welcome and encouraged uh, to visit GitHub and uh, submit pull requests, file issues, and participate in the technical work of the projects. But we also encourage you to visit NumFocus, come talk to us uh, about uh, fiscal sponsorship as well. It makes a huge difference. Uh, an example of the type of thing that uh, many of our core projects would like to do, but are often unable to do, is that uh, typically all of us are work in distributed teams. Um, so IPython and Jupyter, we have people in New York, we have people in California, people uh, in Europe. Uh, a lot of the projects are like this. And remote work works great for many situations or for many parts of, of the development. There are some really hard technical problems where you just have to get together in a room with all the core devs for a week and, and work on something. And right now, there's a lot of core projects that simply do not have the money to do that. And that prevents them from tackling the big uh, things that they want to work on. So again, please, please, if you've not already, uh, talk to us. Visit NumFocus's website uh, to uh, become a fiscal sponsor. This doesn't have to be something huge and massive. Even small amounts help a lot. This is critically important because um, because. <laughs> Sorry, I've gotten off of my cue a little bit here. Um, it, it's critically important. I think I've covered some of this. Um, I think one thing that has really struck me is uh, the, the, the rate at which all of these projects are moving right now, uh, and also not from a, just from a technical perspective, but also uh, from an organizational perspective. Uh, what's happening with NumFocus uh, is just amazing. Uh, the other night, uh, when the other core projects gave their updates, uh, I was just stunned to see what everyone's been doing, even though I watch these projects regularly. Um, and uh, we can't do this alone. We really can't. Uh, we support, uh, I think our best guesstimate uh, right now is that there are on the order of around 3 million users of these tools. Uh, and so if you think about what type of company would you need, like if, if you're going to start a startup and you're going to build a staff to develop software and uh, have support people uh, for 3 million users, uh, it would be massive compared to what, what we run these open source projects on. Um, I don't in any way mean to, to guilt trip you. I want you to feel good about these tools and for that good feeling in your heart to cause you to... Uh, participate with us. And again, this doesn't have to be money. It could be like come and help us work on these hard, hard problems together. I hope I did, did a good job improvising the last two slides. After all, I am a NumFocus board member. Please join, uh, join me in thanking everyone at NumFocus. Especially NumFocus Executive Director, Leah Silen. come up to the stage. <laughs> OK. Uh, she's the one who approved these slides. <laughs> Perhaps not in their final form. 
except for this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a surprise. Uh, Leah has worked tirelessly this year promoting and growing NumFocus, supporting our many projects and running amazing events like PyData. Uh, and I can vouch for this. Uh, NumFocus as it stands today would not exist without uh, all of the things that Leah has done over the past few years. Uh, her work is absolutely spectacular in quality and massive in amount. Uh, the amount she works uh, on behalf of NumFocus on, and uh, on behalf of all of you to put on these conferences uh, is truly spectacular. Um, so please give her another hand. Uh, flowers, interstage, left. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Leah, I'm more than willing to help you get back at James afterwards, and we, we can figure something out. Uh, the future uh, is when we'll be hosting more PyData events. Look for announcements from PyData in the US, New York City, DC, Chicago, North Carolina, West Coast, <laughs> and also internationally, London, Berlin, Amsterdam, Madrid, Montreal, if you're interested in sponsoring or hosting any of these events, please get in touch with us at NumFocus. I'm assuming that, uh, and this is really a question for Lee and James, that all of those uh, cities listed are for 2016? Okay, just, so just in 2016, there will be a lot of PyData events. Uh, please watch the NumFocus and PyData websites for more information about those. Join the mailing list for more information. Uh, if you go to the NumFocus website, uh, you can join the mailing list. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Twitter. <laughs> follow us on Twitter. <laughs> follow us on Twitter. Sounds like the presentation is basically over. Or over? It's a question. I can't tell if this is the last slide. <laughs> uh, I told you, not my slides. The meta humor isn't helping. This <laughs> so actually, the, 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 I think this is the last slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. High concept, I was told. Actually, I, I was told that it would be, quote, high concept, that there would be no, quote, fart jokes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Next up, we have Thomas Caswell. He will be talking to us about Cycler. Would you like to make some jokes, Jeremy? <laughs> and up after Tom, Candida Haynes. Either one. Either one. Okay. I don't know how these Mac things work. Sorry. What we're doing now? Let's give Brian one more round of applause for that excellent improvisation. <laughs> You may not know this, but uh, Brian's prior career was as a stand-up comic. He failed uh. miserably, but it turns out he's a pretty good software developer. I wasn't kidding when I said I don't know how to use these Macs. This is actually Mike's laptop. Uh, <laughs> oh, the other day it just came up. Oh, so uh, while Mike is fighting with the with the. Well, Mike is fighting with the Mac. Uh, my name is Tom Caswell. I'm one of the co-lead developers of Matplotlib. Mike is the other one. Um, and I'm going to tell you about Cycler, which is a project that we spun off of Matplotlib uh, during the last development cycle. So uh, as you may know, one of the things that previously was built in is we had a default color cycle. So if you just called you know, plot, 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 it would cycle through a set of colors. Um, the artists have a lot more properties. It would also be nice to to have a default style cycle. So as you cycle through the, you know, as you call plot, 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 you get a solid, then a dash, then a dotted, and, uh, and such. And as we're thinking about how to do this, we're like, okay, we could have a color cycle and a, and, a line and a line style cycle, but now we have to have some way to say, oh, how do these two cycles interact with each other? Do I, do I zip them? Do I uh, take the product? 
Uh, and in the process of working through how we would do that in a general way for the very large number of properties we have, uh, we came up with Cycler. So this is uh, it's a separate project. It's hosted on uh, Matpl under Matplotlib's organization on GitHub. Uh, there's docs. I don't think internet's connected because internet here is fun. Uh, and it's currently pip installable, and it should be available in Conda very, very soon. Uh, uh, I think it is as of yesterday, last night. OK, so this is probably you. Uh, and if you upgrade to Matplotlib 1.5, which we released 10 days ago and should have been on Conda last night, uh, this is a new dependency, so you probably have this on your computer. Um, so the interface is pretty simple. There's uh, basically one helper function, which is like called Cycler, uh, that you give it a string name and then an iterable, and it constructs a cycle over that iterable. Uh, so if you list this, when you iterate over it, you get back a you get back dictionaries, which are the key and then the value. By itself, a single Cycler, you know, I've just taken something that was a list and made it very complex. Uh, but you know, we have nice printing, so that's good. Where the power comes in is that these, the cycle objects are composable. So uh, if I have two of these, oops, I can add them. And what you can't see is that now addition is basically zipping them. So you get the pairwise lockstep through those two. Um, you can also multiply them. And then you get essentially the outer product. Um, and then you know, these things have some nice convenience methods on them. For instance, you can, if you want this, the same thing but backwards, uh, you can slice them. It, that reverses it. If you want every other, come on. Uh, you know, you can you, uh, you can subslice them. All the things you expect work. Um, all right. So demos of why this is useful. So uh, I guess I've kind of. Spoil the punchline there, but you just, if you just add them together, you set them together, you see I get three lines of different line widths and different colors. Great. Um, oh, by the way, this is, this is all using NBAG, which is the notebook backend, which if you know, you can see the coordinates changing and is interactive in your notebook. Um, if you multiply them, come on. Right now we have we have nine lines, which they cycle first, first color, then line width. And if you notice, um, the, these uh, line styles are uh, multiplication is not commutative. If you do in the opposite order, they cycle in the opposite order, as you'd expect. Um, and these are not limited to just simple things. When, you know, cycler, the composition of cyclers returns a cycler. So you can build up very complex uh, style cycles uh, relative, you know, very, with a very terse amount of code. Um, and you know, this is not limited to just cycles. You can actually put data in these things. So if you want to, for instance, uh, run a data sweep over some, param oh, uh, some parameter space, I put the color map name and then x and y. And then you get this plot, which is our, our four new color maps. Uh, there this will be the default in 2.0, which will be out in the next couple months. And that's it. So we hope this is useful to you outside of Matplotlib as well. Uh, next up, Candida Hayes. After that will be Haley Young. Candida is on finding your own data on social networks. Oh, no, I was, I was going to say I'm the second person reading things off that uh, James has wrote tonight, uh, like he like some sort of terrible hostage proof of life situation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have no idea how to do that. Okay, I'll, I'll do it that way. Keep them entertaining. Keep, keep them entertaining. <laughs> Imagine one of James' puns right now.
Actually, while we're waiting, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Candida Haynes. I have lived in New York for almost 15 years. I live in North Carolina now, and I'm excited to hear that NumFocus is going to be there, Hi, Data, next year. So, So earlier today, I presented a poster called My, My Little Data in a Big Data World. And basically, I am just starting out a project on retrieving personal data, securing it, exploring it, and then identifying the tools that aren't big data tools, but enable you to come up with your own questions and run your own analyses on your own data that, is, that you've put online. Sorry. So instead of <laughs> going through that whole presentation, I'm just going to go through a few places where you can pretty easily download full, ar well, full <laughs> archives of your own data online. The example that I used during for the poster was Twitter. And basically, they just have a page set up in your settings where it says resend email, that will actually say something like retrieve your personal data. It'll be something that you'll understand. When you click that button, you'll get that, of course. And you'll receive your data. I actually got my data pretty quickly in two minutes, maybe one. You'll have an index file that looks a lot like the Twitter feed online. It has a nice GUI and a search box. And just to show you how that works, I can see all of the times that I've talked about gratitude. It keeps me going. <laughs> I also downloaded Facebook. And again, they to find this, I, found, I actually found it was easier to do an internet search on the uh, for uh, data or our personal data archive, and then the name of the social network that you're looking for, because the pages are set up so differently. And the interface doesn't always make it easy to find your data. So ah, you get to see my, <laughs> my Facebook page. And down here, you see the settings. Again, you have your general account settings. And right here, which is very easy to miss, you see download a copy of your Facebook data. And here's what you'll see. Um, and I'm just going to click Ads. You'll, you can actually see what kind of information Facebook, <laughs> this is scaring me, is collecting. <laughs> on me that, uh, oh wow, <laughs> that they're using to serve me ads. I'm just going to leave that page right now. <laughs> uh, I also decided to look at LinkedIn. And I don't know where this is on the page. I read it. And there, you can actually request data that they haven't described as being part of the archive that you can get from them. Which And what you already get from them, I think, is pretty robust. Now, this is link, uh, MySpace, which some of you may remember. <laughs> you, may, <laughs> you may notice that their, um, their format is a little different. It's more sparse, sparser. <laughs> and oh, wait, this isn't, I'm sorry, this is LinkedIn again. Where did, I, where did it go? I seem to have misplaced my MySpace data, but they had separate <laughs> HTML. <laughs> they had separate HTML files 
uh, one for each blog post. And this is probably saving me a little bit because there were some embarrassing things that I was putting on MySpace long before we were as sophisticated as we are now about the, what we post online. Um, uh, oh, oh. <laughs> All right, so here's a little Russian roulette. I have no idea what's going to show up here. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> All right, this isn't too embarrassing, actually. Um, yeah, OK. Anyway, <laughs> if you are interested in doing this yourself, I'd love to talk to you and collaborate and find out what you're working on. Um, Google me. That's how you spell my name, C-A-N-D-I-D-A, H-A-Y-N-E-S. Oh, I used Bing. Um, and thank you. <laughs> Uh, coming up now, Haley Young will talk about algorithmic music composition, and on deck is Mike Williams. He will be speaking on gender inference in Python. Uh, and I'm going to kick in with Mike, so I'm going to try to pull down a bunch of mics that don't work here. I've got some on, uh, some on talk space, for Andrew to the Apple talk space in there. Uh, you think I'm kidding, but I'm totally not. It's actually a hop space. So much better. <laughs> no kidding. He was like the, uh, the Trans Am with the, with the leather jacket and the. And whose voice? I don't even remember whose kid's voice was. The but it's up now. Less me. More Python. <laughs> All right. So my name is Hallie. I'm a student at New York University. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about playing with music in Python and more generally playing with computers and music. So um, the field that I call computational musicology is a pretty new field. And it basically deals with two different areas, using an uh, algorithms to analyze music. And that could mean analyzing musical form, analyzing harmony, analyzing melody, analyzing rhythm, or trying to create your own new music. And a lot of times, those go together. You analyze old music in order to create your own new music. So the toolkit that I use, I did not create this toolkit. It's available from MIT. It's called Music 21, and it is a very useful toolkit. Basically, it makes it as simple as you'd think conceptually to create a score. You create notes. Notes have pitches. Notes have durations. You insert the notes into a part. You insert the part into a score, and you have a score. Um, then you can write it to MIDI, which is a sort of audio-ish file, um, or PDF. Um, so you can have a PDF of the score. Um, and it also comes with some corpora musical data, so you can do some nice analysis. So some strategies for algorithmic composition basically can be divided into two. There's the ones that are more data driven, where you're taking previous, um, previously made um, in musical pieces and trying to analyze what makes them work and then re um, redoing that yourself. Or there's expert systems, where you're saying, I know the rules of music, or I'm making up the rules of music, which is what more people do nowadays, is they make up the rules of music. And here's what I'm going to do. And then you create the. Um, still randomly generated, but randomly generated guided by explicit rules, not by what you see from previous pieces. So just a few examples. Markov models are probably the simplest data-driven method. Basically, what you do is you say, I know the probability of going from a B to a C when I'm in this key is a 50%. So I'm going to write music where the probability of going from a B to a C in this music is 50%. But you can do that in more smart ways. You can say, I'm going to trans transition between chords as a Markov model or I'm going to be transitioning with rhythms as a Markov model. And what I've been doing, which I was talking about with expert systems, uses Markov models just for the chord progressions, but then uses other more, um, more in-depth rules for the rest of it. So with expert systems, you can basically divide into three categories. There's musical forms, which it has to do with what's the structure of the music. There's musical transformations, which all music is transformation. All music is repetition. All music is transposition. I don't know if those words mean anything to you, but basically, the music would sound totally chaotic if it wasn't all connected somehow. And to connect it, you use transformations. And then there's musical preferences, because some things will sound good and some things won't. And you have to have rules that tell you what do and what don't. 
Um, I'm not going to talk about this long, but there's also um, machine learning and computational musicology for music analysis. Um, I've done work in automatic key detection, automatic harmony detection. I haven't done any work in automatic music classification, but um, I could talk a little bit about that because from what I do know, which isn't a lot. Um, and I don't think we have time for questions. We do? We do? Demo too. Okay, so first I'll do a demo. demo. Okay. Oh. This? I'll turn it off soon. Okay, I think that's enough. You get the point. That was computer generated, yes. Um, what I'm using right now is MuseScore. That's, I didn't generate this environment. That's a um, open source environment for notation software. But like I showed you earlier, what's really great about Music 21 is it can write things to Music XML, which is a format that other programs can read. So I took what I wrote in Music XML, and now I'm reading it through MuseScore, which is another open source program. Um, any questions? What generated that using MuseScore? Um, a program that I wrote, an expert system program. That, um, it used like elements of Markov models, um, but um, it was basically an expert system. I've had a fantastic Pi Data time. Have y'all? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. One more round of applause for our speakers and sponsors. Hi, I'm Mike Williams. I work at Fast Forward Labs, which is Hillary Mason's new startup here in New York City. We do fancy stuff involving recurrent neural networks and things like that. I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm going to talk about something really stupid that you shouldn't do, which is trying to infer people's gender using Python. Um, in case I run out of time, sorry, what I'm going to talk about is uh, a data set, I've skipped over a slide here, sorry, uh, a data set, to, uh, the Museum of Modern Art dumped on GitHub their data, you can find it if you search for Museum of Modern Art on GitHub, and it's their collection of um, all the work in the archive, um, and I use that to look at uh, how things, how their collection, uh, what they've acquired is very, very with time. I wrote a blog post that I put on my website. I felt like the world didn't have enough introductory pandas tutorials. Uh, <laughs> so you can read that if you want to know how to do group buys. Um, and there's the slide that was out of order. That's the Museum of Modern Arts GitHub. Um, now, all the slides are out of order. I guess I ran random.choice on this. Um, so this was the slide I found when I ran basic pandas on this. This is a histogram of the artists in the Museum of Modern Art um, in the painting and sculpture collection, which is a euphemism for the art you see out in the museum. So not ephemera, not prints, not photographs. And what you'll notice, this is the top 20, is that is a lot of dudes. Um, every single one of those people is a guy. Um, so I decided to play with a, 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 an appallingly named Python library called Sex Machine. Are these talks being recorded? Yes. <laughs> right, so um, Sex Machine is a bad library, uh, and I don't care who knows it. Um, it, uh, it doesn't determine sex, it determines gender. They're not the same thing, and it doesn't use machine learning. So that's the way in which it's a bad name. How does it do what it does? It is a pickle of a dictionary. That's how it does what it does. And the, diction the keys of the dictionary, they, they are tuples. The, tuple, uh, the first value is their first name. The second value is a country. And then the value is their gender, or the as sex machine charmingly calls it, their sex. Um, so you might see, for example, John, United States, and the value would be 
US, uh, sorry, male. Uh, you might see Jamie United States, and that would be female. You might see Jamie United Kingdom or Game of Thrones, and that would be male. Um, so it is a library that, in addition to being rather simple, is, uh, incurs all the usual problems of inferring people's gender from merely their first name, uh, namely that it's, it's a bad idea, it doesn't really work. If you read my blog, I go into more details about that. But for the relevant for PyData, it's got a bad API. Here's the API. No, that's that. It's got an API only a Java programmer could love. Um, so here, this is the entire feature set of this library. Um, and every single line there is a line that is obviously written by a Java programmer. So the first thing they do is there is unnecessary um, hierarchy in the packaging system. Um, then we create an object. This is not an object, and I'll talk about why in a second. Um, and then there's a getter function, which um, you all learn in uh, intro uh, algorithms and data structures, um, and now we don't use. So why isn't this an object? Did anyone see the PyCon 2012 talk, Stop Writing Classes? Yes. Do you know why this isn't an object? It's got two methods, one of which is init. Uh, if you write a class with two methods, one of which is init, sorry, I was saying object there, I meant class. If you write a class with two methods, one of which is init, you've written a function. Um, <laughs> and it should be a module. If, you, if you've got data associated with it, then put it in a module if you insist. Um, so this isn't a, um, a class. Um, the person who wrote this library could have learned something from watching the PyCon talk, Stop Writing Classes, and additionally, Raymond Hettig's wonderful talk, Best Practices for Writing Beautiful Code, which starts off as a uh, pedantic bike shedding rant about PEP8 and turns into a great talk, and I can't recommend either of those talks highly enough. Now, which slide will come next? So this is the result. This is what I, I found. So the data points there, having inferred uh, the gender of the 120,000 uh, items in the MoMA collection and thrown away all the ones by all artists you've seen before. So this is unique artists. And then computed the ratio of uh, artists that sex machine has inferred to be female to the uh, ra ratio that sex artist sex machine has referred to be male. You see this result. And then I use Seaborn, both to make my plots look a little bit nicer, but because it's got this really nice lightweight linear regression model, which I turned into a projection by changing the x limits of my plot. Uh, and you'll find that in just in time for their 200th anniversary in the middle of the 21st century, MoMA will be acquiring female artists at the same rate they're acquiring male artists. Uh, and there's more details on my website. Thank you. So up next, uh, Greg Lamp with Rodeo. Uh, should be easy for the computer to come on because it's already plugged in. Hot, even a hotter hot swap. Perfect. Cool. And Sarah Schneid is up next with Data Visualization Aesthetics. All right, I'm Greg. I am whoops, oh, uh, work at YHAT. We've recently released an open source library called Rodeo. It's an IDE for data science. Installs uh, with a DMG on Mac, EXE on Windows. We're still working out a few kinks on Linux. Uh, but give you a quick demo. Uh, it does a lot of the things. Oops. Let's see how that does. Yeah, a little better. Uh, so it does a lot of the things that sort of an Eclipse, RStudio, IPython style IDE does. Allows you to read in data from a script, execute it in a console. Has some features like predictive type, um, both in the editor and from within the console as well. Uh, whoops. <laughs> uh, in addition to that, you can do some pretty nifty things like taking a look at some of your data sets. They'll pop up in new windows. You can explore them um, that way as well. And then lastly, one of my kind of favorite features, and I apologize that it looks a little weird with the um, aspect ratio, but uh, you can make plots and just like the IPython notebook, uh, they'll show up automatically. And you can play with them, toggle between them, save them, export them, all that good stuff. If you want to download it, uh, just go to our website, yhat.com slash products slash rodeo. Thanks. Now we have Sarah with Data Visualization Aesthetics. 
next up, uh, Noah. With, uh, I'm a victim of James' handwriting again. My handwriting's very good. I'm going to uh, retitle Sarah's presentation, Please Stop Making Edward Tufty Cry. <laughs> Does that work? <laughs> All right, now how do I get to go away? Go away. All righty. Your presentation then. Dun, dun, dun. You can pretty much see us. So I'm Sarah Schnad, and I'm an artist and a data visualization designer. And I recently joined Continuum as a UX designer on the Bokeh team. And I just wanted to. Uh, make the case for why to make your visualizations beautiful. Um, really, for one reason, I feel like, and in my experience, both with art, art and with data visualization design, um, if you use aesthetics well, um, you can create a stronger intuitive relationship to the data, which can be useful, I believe, although I'm, I don't run machine learning processes myself, so I don't really know this, but I, Imagine it could make it more, it could help with the intuitive relationship with your data set as you go through a machine learning process. But for sure, for sure, it, it's helpful for explanatory visualizations that need to uh, be leg legible and compelling to people outside of uh, your, your um, immediate team and to the general public. So I'm going to show you a few examples. Um, so this one here is a version of uh, census data with a dot for every person plotted onto a map. Um, the data shader, which is a new project that um, uh, Continuum is doing, is an, it's kind of an updated version of this original project. Um, but this is an example where the data set just by itself is quite beautiful when you plot it in its natural state. It is uh, just color coded by race here. So it's pretty um, straightforward and naturally quite beautiful. Um, here's another, another example where a little bit of aesthetic decision making, making, is, make, decision -making is happening. Um, this is flight paths across the US uh, with like a tonal value, kind of emphasizing the path with some uh, different brightness for the density around different cities. So you kind of get a sense of the pattern in the data just from looking at it this way. Another example of this uh, from Stamen Design Studio um, in San Francisco. I thought it might be nice to show here. This is a visualization that shows the explosive dynamic nature of the stock market by color coding different stock trades um, by size for the size of the trade and for color for the uh, different entities doing the trading. And you can kind of see dynamics uh, very easily this way. Another way that you can use aesthetics is to bring in metaphor. This is one you may have seen as a visualization of gun deaths in the United States, where there's a metaphor of the arc of a life. It's kind of giving you this strong feeling of like the, the, the potential life of someone who's, um, uh, who's been killed through um, this unfortunate phenomenon. And, and also this color decision that's being made by uh, a life being gold, and then once the person has been killed after that is the, the rest of the arc of their, what their life would have been using, um, using national health data to kind of project how, what their lifespan would have been. So you can get this really strong sense. So you don't just have this, this numbing number, you actually have this experience of what this data set means. Another example, uh, if you can get some kind of experience of the data that, where the visualization kind of mimics the experience of the phenomenon that can also help. Um, this this uh, visualization actually animates National Weather Sur Service um, uh, weather data all over the country. And when you see the animation, you can actually see the surface of the whole country being shaped by the movement of air over the country. You can also visually um, absorb an enormous amount of data this way if you were to look at the actual tables that are running this uh, animation. Um, you couldn't possibly really take in all of that information. One minute, cool. Uh, a couple kind of left field examples. You can also visualize spatially. That can really help. This is also weather data. This is um, a visualization 
of National Weather Service data of a storm formation, uh, 3D printed uh, in aluminum as an actual physical form. Sometimes one aesthetic strategy, artists do this a lot, is to use a different material than you might imagine to give you this kind of cognitive, cognitive connection slash dis dissonance, dissonance between your idea of the data and the actual phenomenon to get you to experience it kind of in this visceral way. And finally, here's one, the plotting Wi-Fi uh, strength all over the city of Oslo, Norway, with this time-lapse photography of a stick with LEDs on it that sense the strength of Wi-Fi signal as a landscape moving across the city. And this architecture group walked all over the city to create this series of visualizations. There's a wonderful film on, video, on Vimeo about the project, too. You can see the, the name of the people there. And now I'm finished. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm not going to talk about product review metrics. I'm going to talk about product review mining. There will be some overlap if anyone attended the session on understanding product attributes and reviews, but I just want to show you my approach and also a UI that I built that shows a potential use case. So um, my name is Anella. I am a data scientist at a marketing startup called Contently. We help our enterprise clients tell great stories. So I'm going to start with a story about myself. I just moved back here from Australia. Uh, I know when you think of Australia, you probably think of like Steve Irwin and Bondi Beach, but I lived in Melbourne, which is freezing cold and had weather like yesterday, like for the entire winter. So <laughs> in Melbourne, um, here's a picture of my house. It had 14-foot ceilings. It was about 150 years old. Um, but I didn't want to turn on our furnace because it had the 14-foot ceilings. I wanted to save some energy. So I decided I wanted to buy a space heater. And because I'm a lazy American, I went to Amazon to look at space heaters. Um, in Australia, they don't even have Amazon because they're living in the dark ages. But it's, here is the Amazon results in space heaters. Um, yeah, so I'm just like, there are way too many space heaters. They're completely different typologies. They all have different effects. I don't know which one to buy. I don't know which one for my needs. So it's like, so maybe I want something that saves energy, or maybe I want something that um, heats the room really well. So I also studied economics in undergrad. So economics is a lot of like 2D line charts, supply and demand, blah, blah, blah. So I thought, how would an economist go about this multi-objective search? Now, I might be like, uh, consider trade-offs. Say you want um, low price and good for your energy bill, try to plot those two things and then look for the good outliers. So here's an example. This is on medium. Um, this is actually temperature versus electric bill. So you're looking, what I wanted was to have a scatter plot like this uh, that, so I could look for the good outliers. So to do this is basically two different tasks. One is to discover what are those axes. Now, I made price a default, but the otherwise you have to discover and basically extract the product attributes. And I got these from um, review scrape from Amazon. So this is across the entire product category space, not just one product. And then I also, and then you have to do some sentiment scoring um, to score each data point along those metrics, which I may or may not get to. So I worked on this problem. Um, so basically, I created this app that, where you could search for space heater, and it would return these automatically extracted features. So 
if you saw the other presentation, she, she did some topic modeling, she looked at some word to vec. I didn't do any of those things. Um, all you, I really had to do was look for frequently mentioned nouns. Um, for the unigrams, I looked for me frequently mentioned nouns that were mentioned at a higher frequency than like a generic corpus because this is like, people are talking in a slightly different manner because they're only talking about space heaters. And then for the bigrams and trigrams, I just looked at noun phrases with a um, high PMI. So then you can go to explore trade-offs. I don't know if you can see this that well, but you can choose one or more features, look for the trade-offs. So for instance, electric bill and temperature. I hope you can see this. Uh, and then you can, I also mind correlations so to find those trade-offs. Now some of these correlations, I'm gonna admit, don't make any sense, but um, this is really just about exploring the space. So electric bill and temperature, for instance. So these were all generated in D3. And then you can look for the good outliers and it will also show you how it scores along other dimensions and it will give you um, the contextual reviews. Because the aggregates are great for the visualization, but then I see this, I'm also like, okay, where's the context? I wanna see what the person said. So yeah, there's an example of what you can do with text mining. It was NLTK, mainly some pandas and uh, scikit-learn for sentiment analysis. Thank you, thank, thank you, Anila. As as a proud Melbourneian, I do have to correct the the horrific slur that you started that talk with. I'm sorry. Melbourne is beautiful. It does not get cold there. Nobody needs space heaters. It is always beautiful, five to thirty degrees across the year. And everyone who thinks that cold lives in this country because all the Canadians in the room have gone, oh, that sounds so good. <laughs> now, that, uh, now that Steve is done defending Prison Island. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, wow. We're, we're going to hear his real talk, which is called a five-minute apology to continue analytics. <laughs> yes, it's, it's some, something I was taught growing up is that when you make a mistake, the best thing you can do is come out and, and be very public about it, be very clear, and, and make a formal apology. So this is what I'm here to do today. As a CPython core developer, we make mistakes. And, and this one in particular is one that, that I know that Continuum Analytics is quite upset about, and so I do need to directly address the apology to Continuum Analytics. If you aren't familiar with what they do, one of their big products is Anaconda. You go off and you download and you get all of these packages pre-built. And, and this is a really big deal on Windows because if you've ever tried to build a Python package with C code on Windows, you failed. <laughs> I guarantee you fail. I fail. Every time I try to do it, I fail. It's really, really hard. Why is it so hard? The reason it's so hard is because of the compiler we've used and the C runtime. This is a little bit technical. Uh, but hopefully I can get by with no slides. Oh, I get the Anaconda logo behind me. Excellent. <laughs> the reason is because back when Python 2.7 in particular was built, the latest compiler was, uh, was part of Visual Studio 2008, which shipped with a version of the Microsoft C runtime version 9.0. And that is part of the public interface. That link, uh, that compiler is very tightly linked to the DLL. That DLL is part of the public interface. If you build an extension, you need to use that DLL or you're gonna be broken. When Visual Studio 2010 came along, we changed the compiler and changed the DLL. So to build a package compatible with Python 2.7, you need to use the exact same compiler that was used to build Python 2.7. We can't change the compiler or all the extensions of the world break. And you can't get the compiler because Microsoft doesn't give it away anymore. Which is not strictly true because I went and, and sat in people's offices until they agreed with me and we re-released that compiler. So things got a little bit easier. That's not the apology. Because Python 3.3 came out and 3.4 and at that point Visual Studio 2010 was the latest compiler so we used that. And that uses a different version of the C runtime but it has that same tight linking. If you want to build an extension for 3.3 and 3.4 you need to use a different compiler. You need to find a different compiler and it's not freely available anymore. You can still get it if you're very patient or you work at Microsoft. Those are, the, those are the two conditions. What did I actually do that upset Continuum? 
a huge part of their business is building these packages that are really hard to build and giving them away. So how could I spoil that for them? Python 3.5 on Windows is built, again, with the latest version of the compiler, Visual Studio 2015. What's changed now is the C runtime that comes with that doesn't have a version number, which means that as the compiler moves forward, the interface for the C runtime does not change. And so you can still use that in 10 years' time with a newer compiler, and the extensions you build will be compatible all the way back to Python 3.5, and also be compatible with 3.9, 3.12, whatever we're up to at that point. And in fact, if you use the limited ABI marker when building your extension, there's a good chance you build it once for all of those versions of Python, and nothing changes. What I've done by doing that change, which was largely my own effort going through the Python code base, changing build settings, fixing bugs, is made it so it's easy for anyone to build extension packages for Python. Continuum's big business model, they pre-build the packages for you and give them to you. When I met Travis, when I came here, uh, he, he did not have his usual smile. <laughs> he, just the beard. The handshake was not the usual handshake. <laughs> the greeting was something that I'm not going to repeat while I'm being recorded, <laughs> but it was his normal politeness. Uh, there, there, were no, there was no swearing, there was no angry words. There was, you cost us a lot of time and effort, you realize. <laughs> I hope that they will forgive me at some point. I hope that I can continue to be friends with my friends at Continuum. But I also hope that everybody takes the opportunity to get hold of Python 3.5 if you're on Windows and be able to build extensions using a modern C compiler one that's not going to break the next time we release an update and build extensions that are more reliable and more compatible with all the versions of Python into the future. Thank you.